Good morning, family. Happy Sunday. Hope you guys are doing incredible. Really excited about our time together. I want you to let me know how you're doing in the chat. Hope you you've had a great week. If you're doing good, put good in the chat. If you're not doing good, put not good in the chat. If you don't know how you're doing, I want you to let me know in the chat. Hopefully everybody is great, been productive this week, got everything that you needed to get done. All right. I see you doing good, doing good. All right. Great. Great. I am glad to hear it. All right. Doing okay. Doing good. I'm well. All right. I am glad to hear it. Really, really excited about this time together this morning and Hopefully, it will add tremendous value to your life. Doing good, doing great, good. All right, I'm glad, glad to hear it. So, we made an announcement <clears throat> about two weeks ago now uh, that we, of course, we've been in this season of discernment, trying to figure out, you know, God, what do you want us to do? What are, what is, What's our next natural step as a community? And we've landed on our intention to plant a missional church. So we made the announcement on Easter Sunday of the name of this missional church. So I just want to reiterate that uh, before we launch into where we need to be. So of course we are intending to plant a missional church. The name of that missional church is Kingdom South. The name of that missional church is Kingdom South. Kingdom South. Shameless plug, if you have not followed, liked us on Facebook, you can do so. Kingdom South has a Facebook page, so if you just type in Kingdom South, it will come up. Uh, if you're on a desktop or something like that, you're going to type the entire address, just uh, facebook.com uh, slash we are Kingdom South. So I'm really excited about that. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I believe that God is with us and we're going to get everything that is before us completed. All right. So we are in a teaching that we started last weekend. This teaching is called Kingdom Come. This teaching is called Kingdom Come. And the purpose of this teaching is to prepare us for the work that is to come understanding and embracing really two ideas. The first idea we unpacked last week, which is that we are part of a story that is already in progress. The second part of this series is this tension between already essentially and not yet, which is what we're going to explore this morning. So this is a mini series. So it's only two parts. It, it, it came last week and it's leaving this week. So hopefully, even though it is short, that you've been able to glean some perspective from the first message. If you have not watched the first message, one of the blessings of this platform is that you can go back and watch the first part and be caught up into what we've been teaching. All right. So it's time to go to work. I'm ready. I hope you're ready. <clears throat> We're going to get going. We're going to go to the gospel according to Matthew the gospel according to Matthew. We're going to go to the gospel according to Matthew. Chapter number six. The gospel according to Matthew. Chapter number six. Let me put it in the chat here, Matthew chapter number six, and we're going to read verse number 10. The gospel according to Matthew chapter number six, and we're going to read verse number 10. Reading from the New International Version, which is our primary translation of choice here in this community, Matthew chapter six, verse number 10. This is what it says. Your kingdom 
come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Once again, I want to read this again. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To conclude this teaching, part two of Kingdom Come, when you use some urban language, both of them. I just want you to put it in the chat. Both of them. I just want you to put it in the chat. Both of them. <laughs> both of them. If you're unfamiliar with urban language, this is simply a an urban way to say both of them. That's the politically correct term, but we're going a little urban this morning. Both of them, (laughs) both of them. Put it in the chat. And let's get ready to go to work. So as we prepare to ease into this introduction, I want to do so by providing some necessary context so that you can understand and so that you can respect this content. When we pick up our foundational text, we pick it up in the midst of a teaching that Jesus is doing that is part of a larger teaching or larger series of sermons called the Sermon on the Mount, which encompasses Matthew chapters five through seven. This is where Jesus is teaching about the very counter cultural nature of his ministry and of the new kind of life he is coming to institute. So he juxtaposes his way, his belief, his practices with the ways that have been common in their dominant culture. And I believe that as it was in Jesus's day, it is today that we need to draw a clear line of distinction between Jesus's way and the way that has been dominated by culture. So we're going to start our reading at the beginning of the chapter so that we can understand what Jesus is communicating here in Matthew 6. So I want you to go back just a couple of verses. I know we read Matthew 6, verse number 10, but we got to go back just a couple of verses so that we can get the necessary context so that we can understand and we can appreciate the content. So Matthew chapter six, beginning at verse number one, Matthew chapter six, beginning at verse number one, I want you to listen and pay attention to the words that Jesus says. Matthew chapter six, verses one through four. We're not playing any games. Matthew chapter six, verses one through four. This is what he says. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay. I hope you see what I'm talking about here. 
in this series of teachings, Jesus is drawing a contrast between his way and the way that has often been dominated by the culture. Jesus is showing that following him means that you are different and that difference, watch this, shows up in the way that you live. Because once again, he, he, he died to be our savior. He lived to be our example. So Jesus is telling them he first starts off with the conversation around charity. And he says, when you give, don't announce it with trumpets. So if you're doing it to be seen, he says, then you have no reward from your father in heaven. And I don't know about you, but I don't have time to be doing anything I'm not getting credit for in heaven. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't have time to be doing anything. I'm not getting credit. I'm okay with not getting credit for it on earth, but I have no time to be doing anything I'm not going to get credit for in heaven. He says when you do it to be seen, that is your reward. Because that's what you wanted. You wanted to be seen. They saw you. And now that's all you're going to get from that. Now, I find it interesting that he likens it to this word that we have a tendency to use in modern culture, the word hypocrite. Now, generally, we use it to suggest that there is some discrepancy between who people say they are and then who they actually are. Now, we know that this is not a theological term. It is really a theatrical term because before there were makeup and all kinds of things that we have now in terms of television and movies that in the theater, they wore masks. So you would have someone who was playing multiple parts So they would have one mask on in one scene, another mask on in another scene. And so it is not simply just imperfection because all of us are imperfect. It is it is imperfection. Watch this. That is being used to benefit yourself in some way, shape or form. It is portraying to be something that you are not. So that you can gain something that you would not gain if you had if you if you revealed that you were not what you say you are. I hope you're picking up what I'm putting down. So it is it is classic manipulation. And Jesus says, don't be like those folks. And the first example he gives here is charity. I want to let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Now, don't trust me. Trust the Bible. Matthew chapter six, verses five through eight. Don't trust me. Trust the Bible. He says. And when you pray, uh oh, so he starts off with charity. And now he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, There's that there's that distinction. Go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Watch this. This is Jesus talking now. This is the part where we should sit up because this is Jesus talking. It's not Moses. This is not the pastor. This is Jesus talking. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Okay, I hope you I hope you're understanding the point here that Jesus does all throughout these these series of teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, where he draws a clear distinction, a contrast between his way and culture's way, his way and culture's way, his way and culture's way. That's what this is about, ladies and gentlemen. Christianity, the faith following Jesus is countercultural. It will put us at odds with the culture. 
And when I say putting us at odds with the culture, I'm not talking about we're out here being judgmental. We're out here being extremists. We're out here. No, no, no. But the way that we live our life, the way that we handle situations, the way that we go about things, it should be different. Because if I'm going to be like the people and like the culture, then I don't need Jesus for that. Yeah, I don't need I don't need the Holy Ghost to cuss you out. I, I don't need the Holy Ghost to treat you unfairly. I don't need the Holy Ghost to judge you. I, I don't I don't need the Holy Ghost to gossip about you. I, I don't need the Holy Ghost to manipulate you. I don't need the Holy Ghost to be deceptive. If I'm going to if I'm going to need the Holy Spirit, it is to live differently. I want you to put it in the chat. Live differently. Live differently. Live differently. Live differently. That is the call for the Christian. That is the call for the believer. That is the call for those of us that have made the decision to follow Jesus. Our call is to live differently. It's to live differently. It's to live differently. And if we're not going to live differently, then we don't need Jesus for that. We don't need Jesus to be like everybody else. Our call is to live differently. Okay, so Jesus in this in this opening chapter gives us this instance where he talks about charity and how he doesn't want us to be like the hypocrites. He then says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. And if you keep reading in Matthew 6, he later on, he's going to talk about fasting. And he tells us, don't be like the hypocrites. So he he draws this, this very interesting, very, very interesting line in the sand that I want to expose us to this morning. And this is a part, those of you who are part of our community, this is where we really need to lean in because this is a part of what I believe God is using to make us different and distinct. Because in in Matthew chapter six, verses one through eight, so far, we've been exposed to Jesus drawing a line in the sand. Let me say it again, because I'm getting ready to turn the corner. We we were being exposed to Jesus drawing this very distinct line in the sand. Jesus has drawn a line in the sand. (laughs) And as a community that that has committed ourselves to Christ likeness, as a community that's committed ourselves to following Jesus, we've got to be real, real clear on where this line in the sand is. So why would Jesus tell us in verses one through four not to be like them in terms of our charitable giving? And then in verses five through eight, not to be like them in terms of the way that we approach prayer. This is why Jesus said that y'all ready for this. If you ready for this, put ready in the chat. If you are ready for this, because I'm getting ready to turn the corner. If you are ready for this, I want you to put ready in the chat. If you're ready for this, I want you to put ready in the chat. It's about to get tight. Hang tight. It's about to get tight. It's about to get tight. I'm getting ready to turn the corner. I am getting ready to turn the corner. If you're ready, put ready in the chat. (laughs) I see you. Ready, ready. All right, let's get it. Why did you, why would Jesus spend the first eight verses telling us this? Why would Jesus spend the first eight verses of this chapter telling us this? Here it is. Jesus is telling us this so that we can understand just because a practice looks spiritual doesn't mean it's Christian. I want you to sit with that for a second. Just because a practice looks spiritual doesn't mean it's Christian. Come on, I need you to look at me, guys. Just because a practice looks spiritual doesn't mean it's Christian. Now, charitable giving is something that we would agree if we saw someone doing that. That's spiritual. That's moral. (laughs) That's ethical. (laughs) That's kind hearted. That's goodness at work. If you see someone praying, you would say that's spiritual. You see someone using good words, you would say, oh, that person's close to God. 
They know what to say and they know how to say it and they and all the things and they, everything. And, and, and Jesus is drawing a very distinct line in the sand, telling us that just because they practice look spiritual doesn't mean it's Christian. Listen to me, guys. This is why this community, this is why God is calling us as a community, because we've got to re-engage Listen to me. If you're part of our DNA nights, then you already know where I'm going. We've got to re-engage the West with the gospel. Because generally when we think about missional, we think about overseas. We think about people in other countries that don't know Jesus. And I am arguing that there are people in America that don't know the Jesus of the Bible. They know the Jesus that they learned in Sunday school. They know the Jesus that they learned from from Big Mama. They learned the Jesus that might be in their head. They learned the Jesus from social media, but they may or may not know the Jesus from the Bible. And the Jesus from the Bible wants us to understand that there are practices that are spiritual, but they are not Christian. And we've got to draw a line in the sand. People are saying, oh, you know, we can't judge nobody. And absolutely, we cannot. However, comma, we do need to be clear that there are practices that are spiritual, but just because they're spiritual doesn't mean they're Christian. Jesus has a different kind of way that he wants us to live as his followers. Jesus has a different kind of way that he wants us to give as his followers. Jesus has a different kind of way he wants us to love as his followers. Jesus has a different kind of way he wants us to pray as his followers. And just because you see someone doing something that looks spiritual doesn't mean that particular thing is Christian. I didn't say that. Grandma didn't say that. That's what Jesus said. Okay, it gets gooder and gooder. We can return the corner because we gotta, we gotta, we've got to introduce this language that Jesus uses. Once again, this is not, this is not my idea. This is the book. I am teaching the book. So let's keep reading. So far, we've gone through Matthew chapter six, verses one through eight. Let's keep reading. Let's look at verse nine. Let's look at verse nine. Don't miss it. Let's look at verse nine. Let's look at verse nine. It, it's getting ready to get gooder and gooder. Gooder and gooder. Here it is. This then, this is why I love. Oh, okay. Watch me for a second. Watch me for a second. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. <laughs> watch me. This is why I love Jesus. Because what he does is he he doesn't just tell us what not to do. Oh, he doesn't just tell us what not to do. Can I go on a purposeful rant for a moment? I think a part of where we have fallen short in the spiritual space, a part of where we've fallen short as spiritual leaders is we have we have majored in telling people what not to do. Okay, how many of y'all real quick in the chat grew up in an environment where all you heard was what you couldn't do? Just put me in the chat. All you heard is what you couldn't do. Just put me in the chat. Put me. Put me. If you heard, you can't wear this. You can't go there. You can't say that. You can't sit there. You can't go there. You can't be around them. You can't do this. No tattoo. No piercing. No this. No that. You all. You can only drink that. You can't drink this. If, if that's the kind of environment you grew up in, just put me in the chat. Me in the chat. Me in the chat. Me in the chat. And unfortunately, in our modern culture, we have we have majored in telling people what they can't do. And I'm not saying I'm not saying that that's not important, guys. I don't want you to mishear me. I'm not saying that's not important. Because there's a part of Christianity, there's a part of following Jesus that comes with morals and ethics. Right. Well, so we're not just saying just do what you want to. No, that's not what we're saying. However, we got to look at the example of Jesus. Jesus didn't just tell people what not to do. When he told them what not to do, he married it with what they should do. Don't trust me. Trust the Bible. Here it is. Here it is. Don't trust me. Trust the Bible. This then is how you should pray. Now, he just told us in Matthew chapter six, verses five through eight, how you shouldn't pray, what you shouldn't do with prayer. You shouldn't be out to be seen and you shouldn't be just babbling on because you think God is going to hear you because you talk well. So he doesn't just leave us there. Because this is that's what happens when you have no example that all you get left with is what you shouldn't do. This is what he says. This then is how you should pray. Don't mess with me. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come. I want you to put it in the chat. Kingdom come. Kingdom come. Put it in the chat. Kingdom come. Kingdom come. Yeah, that's not my concept. It's not my idea. This is what Jesus said. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Would you put it in the chat? Kingdom come. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, y'all know I am big on clarity. I'm big on working definitions because there, there it is possible because many of us, we're coming from different church backgrounds, different upbringings. Some of us have had different experiences with church. Some of us have been in church all our life. Some of us have been in church here and there. And some of us don't really have a whole lot of church background. Wherever you are on that spectrum, I love you. I am so glad you are here. And I am never going to teach anything and leave you out. No matter where you are on the spectrum, I'm going to make sure I say something that can bring you in. So when we use certain terms, I as a spiritual leader cannot take for granted that everyone knows what I mean when I use those words. Because many of these words are not exclusive to our community. So we cannot take for granted that just because you've heard them, that you, that I mean the same thing that the person or the people meant when they said it. Does this make sense, guys? I want to make sure that when I use a word that we're not assuming that I mean something based on your prior experiences with that word. So when I use the word kingdom, what am I talking about? Here it is. When I use the word kingdom, what am I talking about? We define the kingdom as God's comprehensive rule over all creation. We define the kingdom as God's comprehensive rule over all creation. Again, we define the kingdom as God's comprehensive rule over all creation. That breaks down into four things. Number one, God's kingdom originates in the spirit realm. This is not an earthly concept. God's kingdom originates. Now, it has implications for the earth, but it originates in the spirit realm. Number two, God's kingdom reflects his sovereignty. He is sovereign. He has the final say. He's got all the power. Number three, God's kingdom operates for his glory. And number four, God's kingdom operates according to his will. Once again, it is it is it originates in the spirit realm. It reflects his sovereignty. It operates for his glory. And according to his will. So when we say kingdom, we're talking about God's comprehensive rule. Over all creation. Essentially, let me put it where you can feel it. We want to see the evidence of God's rule in every area of our life. So we want there to be tangible, visible evidence that God is in control. I want you to put it in the chat. God is in control. God is in control. That That's what... We, we want tangible evidence in every area of our life that God is in control. We want to, we want tangible evidence that he's in control of our money. We want tangible evidence that he's in control of our mind. We want tangible evidence that he's in control of our mouth. We want God to rule our life, not just our church life, our whole life. Come here. Not just our church life, our whole life. That's what kingdom means. We want his 
his rule. We want it to be, watch this, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. Can I give you three things that we need in order to possess the kingdom? If I can give you three things that we need in order to possess the kingdom, put yes in the chat. We're getting ready to wrap up, guys. Can I give you three things that we need to, in, in order to possess the kingdom? Three ways that we possess the kingdom. That is God's comprehensive rule over all creation. Put yes in the chat. God's comprehensive rule over all creation. How do we actually possess it? Because once again, guys, we don't just want to use terms because we're going to have people ask us, what does that mean? And this kingdom message is so important that it's, it's, it's the name of the church. So we got to be real, real clear on what we mean when we say that, because there are people who use kingdom language and they don't mean the same thing we mean. And we need to be able to make that distinction for people when they ask. All right, the first way that we possess the kingdom, wait, first way we possess the kingdom, we possess the kingdom through prayer. We possess the kingdom through prayer. We possess the kingdom through prayer. I'm not making it up. It's in the text. He says, when you pray, when you pray, so this, your kingdom come, your will be done is part of a prayer. So we possess the kingdom, guys, through prayer. It starts with prayer. And remember, when we're talking about, when we, we, we use the definition we use for prayer is prayer is a communicative response to the knowledge of God. The more I know about God, it impacts the way that I pray. That, that prayer can be written. It can be, it can be oral. It can be mental. So if we're talking about journaling. We're talking about praying out loud. All of that stuff. Prayer. We possess the kingdom through prayer. He says, when you pray, you pray your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. So if we want God's comprehensive rule over all creation, it starts with prayer. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and do what? Pray. There, there is no kingdom apart from prayer. Listen to me, guys. There is no kingdom apart from, I don't care how many properties we buy. I don't care how much good we do. There is no kingdom apart from prayer. There is no kingdom apart from prayer. I want you to put it in the chat. No prayer, no kingdom. It, it's simple. No prayer, no kingdom. I don't want us to be confused. I don't want us to be lost. I don't want us to be wandering. No prayer, no kingdom. No prayer, no kingdom. No prayer, no kingdom. So we're getting ready to enlist so those of you who have a passion for prayer, we're getting ready to enlist you to be a part of something that we're getting ready to start. Because one of the things that we're going to need to do amidst this launch work is we need to bathe it in prayer. Because there is no kingdom apart from prayer. I don't care how many tongues you speak in. There's no kingdom apart from prayer. <laughs> I don't care how many two steps you can do. No kingdom apart from prayer. He says, when you, when you pray, you pray your kingdom come. It, it, it doesn't just come down. You pray it down. It doesn't just come down. You pray it down. All 
Okay, not only do we need prayer, not only do we need prayer, don't miss this, guys. Not only do we need prayer, y'all ready for this? Not only do we need prayer, number two, number two, we need principles. We possess the kingdom through principles. We possess the kingdom through principles. We possess the kingdom through principles. There are things that God has put in place. And when we violate those things, we forfeit the outcome that he has promised us. Come on, I need you to look at me, guys. The, when, the, when, when he puts principles in place, it's order. And when we violate those principles, we forfeit the promises, the outcome that he has promised. And some of us are frustrated because we did not get the result that God promised. And we didn't get the result because we didn't do it God's way. Principles. There are principles. Listen, oh boy. L listen to me, guys. I love you. Listen. Some of some of the problems that we encounter is life lifing. That happens to all of us. It rains on the just and the unjust. As as the wise man said, time and chance happen to them all. So some of that is that. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials, you will have tribulations that, that come with earth. But some of the problems that we encounter is a direct result of us violating principles. Adam and Eve didn't get kicked out of the garden because they didn't pray. Y'all better come get me. I said Adam and Eve didn't get kicked out of the garden because they didn't pray. Huh? Adam and Eve didn't get kicked out of the garden because they didn't pray. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden because they violated a principle. I'm gonna let y'all sit with that. See, this is the part, this is the part we we this is the part where we get quiet in church. They got kicked out because they violated a principle. He said. You can eat freely from any tree in the garden except this one. Come on now. Come on now. Is that what he said? They didn't get kicked out because they didn't pray. They got kicked out because they did violated principles. This is why I posed the, this is why I posed a statement to us on Easter Sunday. If you believe he got out of the grave, if you don't believe he got out of the grave, then why believe anything he said? If you believe he got out of the grave, then why not believe everything he said? There are principles that he gives us. He tells us to think on certain things, whatever's good, whatever's lovely. Whatever. He tells us to think on these things and the peace of God. So we saying, God, I don't have this, I don't have that. What did you do with his way? See, we want to do, we want to do it our way and we want him to bless it. Principles. Principles. You, you can't violate the you, you can't violate the principle and expect to get the outcome. So a part of the kingdom, we possess it through principles. When, when he tells us to give, that's a principle, guys. Now we can let people talk, tell us it's a command, and we're not on the, all this other stuff. It's a principle, guys. It's a principle. Okay, no, no, number three, y'all tired of me? I'm, I'm, we getting ready to go. Number three, y'all, y'all tired of me? It's, it's okay. <laughs> number three, y'all tired of me? If you're ready for number three, put ready in the chat. We getting ready to wrap up. 
we're getting ready to wrap up. If you're ready for number three, put ready in the chat. So not only do we need prayer and principles, we possess the kingdom through practice. We possess the kingdom through practice. Put these things into practice. Do them. We possess the kingdom through do them, guys. We got to We got to do them. We got to put them into practice, not just hear them. James tells us if you're just hearing the word and you're not doing it, you're deceiving yourself. We got to put these things into practice. And this is a lifelong commitment. Remember, guys, originally they were not called Christians. They were called followers of the way. The way is something that you practice. That's who the disciples truly are, the ones who hear these and put them into practice. So you you can read all the books you want on prayer. You know how you learn how to pray? Practice. You, you, you know how you you know how you learn any of the spiritual disciplines? Practice. Those of you who play sports, you know how you how you get better at sports? Practice. How you get better at shooting free throws? Practice. It don't just jump on you. Just because you go in the gym, free throws don't just jump on you. A jump shot is not just going to jump on you because you walk through the gym doors. You, you, you want a certain body? You want to look a certain way? You know how you get that? Practice. You know what working out is? Practice. We get the kingdom through practice. The stuff that he tells us to do is not just one time. Even in the scriptures where he says, he says, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking the door shall be opened. That's, those, those words are continual in the Greek. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Practice. And so I want to encourage you, family. We we gotta this this not this, we're gonna be doing this for the rest of our lives. We're gonna be doing this for the rest of our lives. From now until heaven, we're gonna be practicing. What are we gonna be practicing? The way. That's we're gonna be loving our enemies until we go to heaven. We're going to be fighting to keep our hearts away from from riches and 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 stuff until we go to heaven. We're going to be fighting to be tempered until we go to heaven. Practice. We possess the kingdom through prayer, through principles, and through practice. There is no Comprehensive rule in every area of our lives without prayer, without principles, and without practice. Now, I want to I want to I want to show you something, and then we're, we're we're done. He says, "On earth as it is in heaven." On earth as it is in heaven. So the idea of kingdom has both present. And eternal, or the theological term, eschatological implications. Just a $2 word, which means end times. So it has implications both in, in the present life and in the life to come. There are certain aspects and elements of the kingdom that we will not experience until we get to heaven. But there are certain aspects and elements of the kingdom that we can experience here on the earth. And a part of our call as a missional community is to do our part to experience and to bring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's our vision statement, guys, in South Carolina as it is in heaven. 
So I want to give you this sticky statement. I want you to take a take a picture of the screen, whatever you need to do, so that you can capture it. The kingdom is both now and not yet. We shouldn't allow our preoccupation with the not yet to keep us from the now. Don't miss this. The kingdom is both now and not yet. We shouldn't allow our preoccupation with the not yet to keep us from the now. One more time. The kingdom is both now and not yet. We shouldn't allow our preoccupation with the not yet to keep us from the now. There are certain things that we will not experience, guys, until we get to heaven. But then there are some things that we can where we can experience heaven on earth. And that's what we want. We want that. That's what we're after. We're not after we're, we're, we're not after fame and fortune and notoriety. We are after heaven on earth. That's it, guys. That's the vision. We are after heaven on earth. I want you to put it in the chat. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. We are after heaven on earth. That is the kingdom. And that is what we want to come. All right, guys, I hope this has been enlightening for you. I hope it's been transformative. I hope you have been inspired. I hope you've been challenged during these two messages. Of course, as we continue to journey, we're going to dive deeper into this idea of the kingdom, which is why DNA nights are so important. Shameless plug. So every Wednesday, with the exception of the first Wednesday, because that's our Sabbath, uh, every Wednesday, at 6.30, we're doing DNA nights where we're talking in depth about what it looks like to plant a church. We're going through everything. We just wrapped up our core values. We're getting ready. We're getting into our leadership structures and so many other things. So if you, I know some of you work on Wednesdays and that kind of thing, you cannot tap in. We're usually on Zoom on Wednesdays. So if you can, if it is at all possible, everybody's already muted. So you don't have to say anything. You just Tap in, put your earbuds in, and you can listen to so that this can get into your hearts uh, so that we can become the kind of people that God wants us to become. And one of the ways that we're able to do that is through your generosity. So we thank you so much for your generosity. It is because of your generosity that we're able to position ourselves for the open door that God is getting ready to open for us. So we thank you so much for being obedient to God. We thank you so much for seeing something within this community that you feel led to be a part of, you feel led to support. There's some of you who you may not be a part of this community, but you're like, hey, this word really blessed me. You can support this work that we're endeavoring to do. And we're so, so grateful for that. Um, once again, if you have not watched part one of this teaching, go back and watch part one so that it will all make sense and you'll have a nice a puzzle piece put together. I want to pray for you and then we're going to let you go. I hope you have an amazing week and get everything that you need to get done. I hope you are safe this week. Um, I know there's been a lot going on in our community. So if you're a part of any of the families that have lost loved ones, um, if you lost any friends, anything like that, um, our prayers are with you. Um, if there's anything that we can do to serve you, please let me no. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come together. Thank you for this medium of technology that allows us to be connected to one another, no matter where we may be. Lord, I thank you for placing in my heart this vision for a missional church. We pray in advance for Kingdom South. 
pray for the work that you will do through it in our community. We pray in advance for the lives that will be changed because of it. Lord, we pray that amidst everything that is happening in our culture, amidst everything that happens within the context of church culture, pray that you would keep us focused on our mission. Keep us focused on achieving the thing that you placed in our heart that we are passionately running after. And that is simply heaven on earth. We pray that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if we do that, it will be said of us as it was said of the early church. These are they who have turned the world upside down. In Jesus name. Amen. All right, family. Hope you guys have an amazing week and I will see you right back on this platform next Sunday. Take care.